Ben, we know you're extremely busy in all aspects of life, but how on earth do you manage to fit um, your interest of horse racing in? Because it's, it's my hobby. I don't get to go midweek racing, that is, because my horses are either in Ireland or down Somerset, but Saturdays, if they're racing, I do try and get there. How did it develop? Can you take us back to your very first interest in the, in the turf? Oh, gosh. Um, if you go right back, my father was always interested in horses, not owning them, just betting on them. But it's only a one-pound accumulator. You know, he used to do it every day, every morning, and then we would sit and watch the Grand National and the Derby, that sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't until I was, oh, gosh, in my early 40s, when my wife, who's a very keen um, horse rider, said that I should, en I should enjoy r owning a horse rather than just watching them and try pursuing to buy one. And uh, I was very busy at Sage at the time. But one night we went out for dinner with some friends and uh, one glass of wine too many and uh, I was on my way down to Howard Johnson's yard to see a horse. Um, going down there, um, my wife said, I hope uh, he's got a grey one for sale because I love grey horses. And he pulled out two grey horses. So I wasn't sure which one to buy, but uh, I got my friend who was a vet come in and look at them and I picked one called Lord Transcend, who won his first five races and that was me hooked. But my second horse was Royal Rosa, and my third was Ingalls Dreaver, my fourth was Arcalus, and my fifth was No Refuge. Yeah. And the three of the last three won at Cheltenham on the same, same week. So I was definitely hooked by then. And nowadays we don't see your, your flat interests at all, do we? Why, why did you pack up on the flat? Um, I just found it much harder to actually win on the flat and uh, less enjoyable. And uh, we try to run as a business. We tried to you know, buy a young horse as a, a yearling or a foal, train it and then hopefully move it on and sell it and, uh, and reinvest that money in horses. But uh, it's just very difficult to do that on the flat. Uh, yeah. you know. It's dominated by, um, by, the, by the Irish and by, and by the Sheikhs. And I find it hard to compete. Whereas in jump racing, because there's no stud value really, uh, prize money only, I, I find it more enjoyable. It seems to me as though um, you fit very comfortably into the fabric of owning jumpers anyway. There's a great mm. sort of camaraderie between you and the other leading owners, the well, likes of JP and Andy Stewart yeah, and, and yeah. the late David Johnson, etc. Well, there is, and, and, I, and I found that as a big difference from flat racing, whereas I think jump owners are very, very much, you know, it's all about the horse and well done and look forward to them running and jumping. And uh, the competition, obviously, is there, but it's not as, as competitive as, as flat racing. So we're all big friends together, yeah, and, you know, yeah, I've been to JP's uh, house for dinner and, uh, and Andy's as well, so uh, it's, it's all good, for, good pals. In the early days, you, you were very, very loyal to, to <coughs> Howard, and he did you very proud, didn't he, with all those Cheltenham Festival winners. Um, how important is it to you to, I mean, you, you've invested um, a lot in the local area. Was it very important to you to also do that, that in the horse racing sphere as well? Um, that was more of a coincidence, Mike, to be mm. honest. Um, the fact that Howard was half an hour from my house, I used to uh, go down there every week and watch the horse on the gallops and walk around the stables with Howard and he would tell me his dreams and aspirations for each of the horses, which was fascinating stuff. Um, I used to really enjoy that part of the, part of the business. Um, and I suppose as part of that I, I miss more than anything else is the fact that, I, you know, with Paul being in Somerset and uh, Willie being over in Ireland, I don't get to see the horses as much nowadays outside of racing. Mm. Um, but, you know, Howard chose me some great horses. And even today, if you, if you look at my success today, they're the, the horses that Howard chose. Mm. On his own, Boston Bob, Tidal Bay, they were all, all horses that Howard bought for me. And three or four years down the line after that situation with Howard, Graham, what are your thoughts about it now? I'll never be let down by Howard because, you know, we had a great friendship, still have a good friendship. His choice of horses for me was, was, was spectacular, as, as has been proved even today, you know, mm. three years on. You know, they're still winning big races. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a sad way for how his career to end, unfortunately, because uh, you know, all he did really, at the end of the day, was try his best for that one horse. Mm. Um, Striking article because he thought he was a superstar, but he had bad legs, and he just tried to do his best to fix the horse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, in the end, my, my view is that he's probably a bit hard done by him, maybe he's you know, taken to task by the BHA for, for doing what he's done and trying to put off everyone else from doing it. Um, I just thought four years ban was very harsh and the fact he's banned from all the race courses in the world so he couldn't even go, go and see races uh, was, was too harsh in my view. He announced his retirement anyway, didn't he, before I think the mm. ban was handed out, probably knowing what was going to happen. Do you think there's any possible chance he might make a, a comeback into the mm. training fold? I'm not sure. And knowing Howard, he might want to just to prove a point, but mm. you know, he's, he, may, he may decide that uh, you know, he's had enough. And, uh, but I'll, we'll just see. It's up to Howard. It's his decision. Um, how difficult was it to, to replace him, in a sense? I mean, you've already mentioned, but obviously mm. you don't see them as much as you did, because mm. 
Willie Mullins is in over in Ireland and Paul's mm. down in Somerset. But did those two trainers almost pick themselves, Graham? Because they, they were, yeah. It was, it was a very, it's a very easy decision for me because people say, how did you choose Paul and Willie? And the answer is quite simple. One was the best trainer in Ireland and one was the best trainer in England. And that was, the, that was the choice. It was quite simple. Has it been interesting finding out um, how they go about training the, your horses and the way they communicate it, the way they, they prepare the horses? That, that must be fascinating. Um, I haven't found out how they prepare the horses because I don't get to go to the stables very often. Um, I might see Paul's stables twice a year, Willie's maybe once. Um, but communication-wise, you know, they're always on the phone to me, or either texting or, or ringing. In fact, I've got a text message in my pocket right now from Willie. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they, they let me know where the horses are going and when, when they're when they're, uh, which, which uh, race they've been primed for. So, uh, but you know, these are two very dedicated, competitive trainers and they want the best for the horses and every horse goes out to win, so uh, I'm delighted with that. And you, you've seen how we, you, you can understand why they are top of their respective mm. piles in England and Ireland because of the way they, they go about things. You uh, without a doubt. That. And the other thing, Mike, is that they've, they've also got a lot of good horses in their stables and they're running against very competitive horses as well. So, you know, one of the things that was disappointing about being up north was that you know, I'd win a race at Carlisle or Kelso, and I think I've got myself a Cheltenham horse. And then I travel down south and compete with Paul Nichols and Nicky Henderson and Alan King and David Pipe and Philip Hobbs, and I find out that actually my horse isn't as good as I thought it was. Mm. And, uh, you know, I find out I Cheltenham or, or one big Saturday race. So nowadays, though, my horses are running quite competitively, even in midweek races. So I know when I go to to the big races that my horse have got a good chance. You mentioned you got off to a great start with Lord Transcend mm. and um, your first Cheltenham Festival winner I think was Arcalis, wasn't it, back mm. in 2005. It, mm. It's amazing, Graham, to think how much success you've had in that um, not even a decade since then. I mean, how, how thrilling was it to win at the festival? Uh, it was more of a thrill nowadays than it was then because I now know how hard it is. Yeah. Um, but yes, it was a great thrill. And uh, you know, I remember those gr there, were, there were great times, especially on three, uh, one day after another. Um, but trying to emulate has been very hard, and your know, title base done it, and uh, you know a few others now. Um, mm. But uh, you know, you go out there always trying to find a Cheltenham horse, and hope to get there. Um, and I've bought a lot of horses in the last ten years, and not all have got got to Cheltenham or Aintree or Saturdays. So I just found out how hard it was. But uh, but when you do get there, it is a great thrill. How thrilling was it to have a horse like English Drever in your, in your colours? I mean, he was a magnificent racehorse, wasn't he? Three world hurdles. He was a great horse. But, you know, Mike, we, we bought him not for going hurdling. We bought him for the Thumberland Plate, which is the one race that I would like to win. Yeah. Um, but I had seven attempts, and I think I've come third last as the best I've had. So maybe that race is not for me. But we bought him for, for, as a plate horse. But when he got back to Howard's and Howard put, popped him over a hurdle, he says, wow, this is something special. I remember going to Aintree for his very first race which was when they used to do the Irish and English Jockey Championship, mm -hmm. and Graham Lee rode him. And uh, he, he was third or fourth favourite, because he was unknown. And uh, he won by, you know, a furlong and a half, I think. And uh, I remember Norm Williams coming to me and said, Graham, you said, got something very special there. I actually didn't know what he was talking about, because it was my first, you know, time really um, over hurdles with, with, with the horse. Um, but then he went unbeaten that season until he got to Charlton and came second in... Um, what was the role in Sunday Alliance, novice mm -hmm. hurdle? And then after that, he was, he was just a super horse because he won three world hurdles and he won three at uh, Newbury and all sorts of stuff. Mm. His longe longevity was extraordinary, wasn't it? I mean, three, three out mm. of world hurdles in four years, Graham, wasn't it? Well, what was amazing, Mike, was he actually, after the first one, he was injured. He had a tendon injury. Mm. And most, most trainers and vets will tell you that once they've had a tendon injury, they're not going to come back as good as they ever were. But he came back and won two world hurdles. So uh, that was, he was a, a special horse. Graham, you, you famously got English Dreamer from Sir Mark Prescott, mm. and that prompted one of Sir Mark's great comments, and then one of his great quotes mm. about waking up in the morning. Yes, he said he used to wake up in the morning thinking about sex, but now he thinks about me, which is quite <laughs> laughing, really, <laughs> but quite amusing. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I bought a lot of horses from, uh, from Mr. Prescott, and uh, you know, they all did, qu did quite well. Not as good mm. as, as, Mr. Dr as English Dreamer, but uh, you know, had some great success with them. And Almost sort of transgressing all that, you got Tidal Bay because he won his, uh, mm. he won the Arkle. You can't believe it now by 13 lengths. Mm. Is he your favourite horse now after all these years? No, Drever's always the favourite. Yes. Um, but yeah, I bought Tidal Bay after he came second in the uh, Aintree Bumper, and uh, I bought him at the DBS sales. Um, he's very expensive at the time. Um, then he won his first couple of novice hurdles. He went to Cheltenham in December and won the novice hurdle there, beating a good horse of uh, Mr. Nichols. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so then we thought we had something very good. Um, and then he went chasing, and he has this very, very characteristic head style and running style. I've described him as a bit like Scooby-Doo, where he has a high head carriage, his legs in all four counties. Um, but he gets from one end of the fence to the other. Um, but I remember, because of that style, he was crabbed quite a bit before Charlton was to... He'll never run in the Arkle and survive, because he's just got such a bad jumping style. Mm. He'll, he'll, he'll not take the pace, he'll not jump very well, and he'll come a cropper. But that day he jumped superb, and as you say, he won at 30 lengths going away in quite spectacular fashion. Mm. And since then, he's gone on to run in three and a half miles, four miles. Um, so uh, he's been a very special horse. Yeah, he clearly has. Um, mm. Didn't quite work out for him in this year's national, sadly, but no. at the time he looked as though he was getting himself into a real nice rhythm until the canal turn. He just got. Uh, I think, you know, Mike, I think the national is just not for him. You know, yeah. that's his second time now, and he's unseated before the. Before the uh, the first bend, so um, but yeah, we, funny enough, we we said to Sam go out wide on the canal turn and just avoid trouble, and guess what? He got into trouble, so the horse in front fell and that took him down. So Golden Way, wasn't it? That was it, yeah. yeah, but, um, yeah. but you know, he he's, he, got, he got around in one piece, which is that was just brilliant. Graham, when he when he came on and, and Abbott at Leopardstown, <coughs> he won the the Lexus that mm. day. That was an extraordinary performance, wasn't it? An extraordinary race. It was and a, he was the old time of beating the youngsters. It was, and uh, it, it, it was typical Tidal Bay because you know he was at the back, and I remember stand. I was actually there with my wife, standing uh, near the winning line, and uh, he clattered the last fence. I think he was fourth or fifth, and we thought, oh well, that's where he's going to finish fourth or fifth. And then he started to, to pick up and pick up. He was getting nearer and nearer. But we still thought he was going to be third or fourth, and to this day I still don't know how he won it. And I've watched that race umpteen times, and ten yards from the line is going to be fourth. And then he, the gap opened up, and Ruby gave him a great ride that day, and yeah. came through and won it. And it was a thrilling finish. Yeah, Ruby's face told it all, told the story, <laughs> it did, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. But um, but it was, it was interesting day that because I'd, um, I had two runs that day. I had Boston Bob, and Tidal Bay, and Boston Bob was an earlier race, and I'd flown across to Leopardstown with Paul Nichols and his wife Georgie, and Boston Bob won, the Grade One the race before. And I think my only thought was, I hope I don't go back with just one trophy because it would be quite a sad flight back, and I was just praying that Tyler Bay would run well so that we had a pleasant flight back. The fact that he won made it a great <laughs> flight back. <laughs> what about um, the supply line of horses, Graham? Mm. I mean, you, you've had uh, remarkable success. I mean, you mentioned about paying lots of money for Tyler mm. Bay, but it's been, been repaid in spades in his instance. Yeah. But we all know, particularly people in racing, know that you're a very wealthy man. I mean, how difficult is it for you to... To, to hold back as, as such, when it must have been tempting to splash the cash and buy anything that, you, that just took your eye. How, do you, how well, do you sort of go about the process of buying them? Well, you do, you do get asked to buy horses virtually every week. Um, and what I try and do is I try and make sure that I haven't got too many horses in the same category. So, for example, for next season, I know I've got some nice two-mile, two-and-a-half-mile, three-mile novice hurdlers. So I'll probably not be looking for any, any of those. I don't have a juvenile, so I'll be looking for one of those. Mm. So I, I just try and make sure that I've got something in each category, but not too many. Um, and then, you know, you, I'm always now looking for a, a winning horse. I, I'll always buy a pointer pointer that's won a race, or a bumper horse, or a novice hurdler in France. So it has to show winning form nowadays, but otherwise I'm, I'm not that interested in this. And do you get the, the heads up from, from Paul and Willie, Paul Nichols and Willie Mullins on these things, or do you have somebody that's out there looking for you? No, 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 I rely purely on Paul and Willie to pick the mm -hmm. horses for me. Mm -hmm. And obviously they get, um, they get asked all the time for, to look at horses. So uh, they, they, by and large, they choose them for me now. I mean, you know, it was Howard, um, but we're now seeing that the, the, the ones that Howard chose from me are now getting on, on a bit. So they're, they're moving out and being replaced by young blood from that both Willie and Paul are choosing for me. Mm. They've got a hard act to follow, haven't they? <laughs> they've got a very hard <laughs> act to follow. But they're doing okay. Yeah. They're doing okay. There's some, some nice ones coming through.